a trillion dollar whale, the future of crypto infrastructure and finance. Please welcome Melton Damaris. <laughs> What I always like to do is sort of connect what's happening in the crypto industry. You've heard a lot of crypto jargon, crypto terms, a lot about trading, markets. Um, I want to take it back to what I'm excited about, which is how do we actually connect what we're building, all of this financial infrastructure, all of this digital infrastructure, to the world we live in. At the end of the day, we are operating in meat space. We interact with things in the real world. And so connecting these two, I think, is a really interesting theme. And that's what I want to talk about today, is what does the future hold potentially for crypto? And how does it connect to the world that we live in? and what's going to happen to this world over the next few decades. So I call this the trillion dollar whale. Um, and I just want to start by talking about what infrastructure actually is. So on the last panel, when these experts in the DeFi and trading space said the word infrastructure, they were talking about financial infrastructure, capital markets infrastructure. But when I'm talking about infrastructure, I'm talking about the physical, digital, and social goods and facilities that support the society that we live in uh, for us to, you know, we all got on airplanes from our respective cities, we took trains, we took buses, we arrived here in an airport. This is all infrastructure. This includes facilities, it includes data storage, it includes universities, the education system, communication infrastructure, but it also includes a lot of new digital infrastructure. And part of what we're building in the crypto space is this permissionless, decentralized infrastructure through protocols that can be used by anyone, anywhere to engage in a variety of different um, transactions, uh, structuring, all sorts of things. But what's really interesting is our infrastructure that we develop over the next decade or two is going to need to be much more dynamic than the infrastructure we've had in the past. Think of how much time you spend on your phone. Think of how much time you spend on your laptop. Think of how much time you spend every day sitting in the physical world, interacting with the digital world. We need a lot of infrastructure. So the opportunity here is fucking massive. Excuse my language, but it's really, really, really large. $100 trillion of infrastructure investing will happen over the next two decades. And the private infrastructure market has tripled in size. Um, how many people here even know about infrastructure funds or have ever invested in an infrastructure fund? OK, a few. Excellent. Um, Unlisted infrastructure funds, which are private financing vehicles, have raised more money than venture capital funds over the last decade. But nobody's talking about this. And um, what I think is really interesting is public sector budgets are constrained. We need private capital to invest in these opportunities. But there hasn't been a lot of innovation in infrastructure finance. It's still really difficult to access, but there's a lot of it that's going to happen. So this is where the trillion dollar whale comes in. If we look at infrastructure, right, this is really much like we say about crypto, it is a new asset class. So if we look at the world today, the largest asset class is real estate at $200 trillion, and that is larger than all other markets combined, which I think is something we don't appreciate. Uh, crypto is teeny tiny. You can't even really read it. It's a little orange dot. Crypto is about a $1 trillion market today, although, you know, varies a little bit. <laughs> uh, a few years ago when I was here, it was a $3 trillion market. But then we look at where infrastructure sits. We have, obviously, equities. We have sovereign debt, non-sovereign debt. Today, infrastructure is still relatively small. It's a $5 trillion asset class. But with this massive investment that needs to take place, it's going to be one of the largest asset classes in the world. And so if we look at the investing landscape, I think when most people think of infrastructure, they think of really boring cash flow assets. That's what I used to think of when I thought about infrastructure. But if we look at this sort of opportunity landscape, most people think of infrastructure as low risk, cash flow generating assets. But there's actually a much wider spectrum as we start to move from regulated infrastructure into partially regulated or even unregulated infrastructure. And you might say that crypto protocols and what we're building operates very much in this opportunistic part of the spectrum. There's capital growth opportunities. It's unregulated. It's higher risk. But there's also the potential for tremendous return. So I think the shifting of infrastructure from this boring, stodgy, old school cash flow generating asset to a dynamic capital growth opportunistic asset is also a big shift and crypto is going to be a big part of facilitating that shift as well. So are you still with me? 
Yes, okay. All right, so the opportunity here is only 4% of portfolios have an allocation to infrastructure today. Very low. $100 trillion, only 4% of portfolios are allocated. So how do we start to change this? And how do we think about what role crypto and all of the stuff we've built over the last decade in this industry will actually play a role in this shift? Well, last year, one of the things I talked about was how power in our world is changing. We no longer live in a world that is dominated by nation states. So historically, uh, governments have acted as finance providers, owner and operators of infrastructure, but that is no longer the case. Uh, if we look at what's happened over the last few years, many of our governments are operating under tremendous debt burden and they need to focus on servicing debt, they don't have the capacity or, frankly, the political desire to engage in the massive infrastructure projects that are needed to actually modernize the world we live in. And so we see large private players emerging. A lot of these are institutional investors, but there are new powers emerging, right? We no longer live in a world that's dominated by nation states. We have these new players. Um, I think we have corporation states. If we look at just the size and scale of some of the largest corporates in the world, whether it's Amazon, which consumes 2% of all electrical power generated in the United States of America. 2% to power their AWS infrastructure. We have uh, Facebook, we have Amazon, we have um, Google, we have Apple. These are huge companies that control a huge part of our life. They control huge swaths of infrastructure, and they're investing in infrastructure. They're building data centers, they're building new facilities, they're building out renewables capacity. We also have my favorite sort of new power player. We have Bitcoin. We have these decentralized public blockchains, and they have tremendous amounts of capital and resources at their disposal. Now, we haven't seen any foundations buying power plants yet, but if anyone in the audience has a large treasury and is interested in building a nuclear plant, we should talk. I have some thoughts for you. But we have these new network states that are emerging. You have people who are highly motivated, who have a lot of capital at their disposal, and who are willing to spend it on building infrastructure to serve this new wave, not only of digital innovation, but also all of the underlying physical and social goods that are going to be needed to facilitate that. And then we have metaverses. I have yet to see a group of children in Roblox negotiate some land purchase this is in the real world, <laughs> but inevitably, as more people spend more time building communities online, this will start to happen. So there's two major shifts that I think are exciting and where we can actually utilize all of the tools and um, protocols we've built in the crypto space to actually make infrastructure finance more efficient. So the first is project structuring, and the second is finance structure. And it sounds very boring, but I promise you it's very exciting. I get very excited about this, so hopefully you will as well. So on the project structure side, we'll delve into this a little bit more, but I think distributed smaller scale infrastructure projects are emerging, where instead of building one really large 20-year facility that costs billions of dollars, people are looking at smaller, more resilient resilient infrastructure. Um, they're aggregating localized, privately owned resources through these protocols that can bring together disparate sources of energy or bring together disparate uh, locations where small compute facilities exist. They're highly adaptable to cyclical demand and changing market conditions. Because they're smaller scale, they're much more flexible, they're much more adaptable. There's a lower regulatory burden. I know regulation gets talked about a lot. Um, there's much more flexibility, a shorter time to market, which is really important, particularly particularly given how quickly our world is changing. And they're more resilient and more secure. Uh, from a cybersecurity perspective, more distribution, more distributed resources are much more secure than having large centralized points of failure. Uh, from a financing perspective, we're seeing a fractionalization of project financing. Some people call it tokenization. We're going to call it fractionalization. Um, there's wider asset distribution. More people can participate. And we're making these really illiquid, really thinly traded markets much more liquid and much much more accessible. We're reducing the administrative costs, especially in places where there is cash flow or where you can automate payments. And most importantly, we're improving transparency, particularly in places where there are complex multi-party agreements or contracts in place. So let's talk quickly about what project structure shifts look like. So I made a little diagram. I made it with clip art. I hope you like it. It took me a long time. Um, so if we look at how we used to build power infrastructure, for example, here, one gigawatt reactor will power about a million homes. And a nuclear power plant today costs about 5 to $7 billion to build, and it takes about 10 to 20 years. 
We don't have that kind of time, right? Um, we then look at the distribution and transmission of that power. Because power plants are located far away from cities and where pe people are actually consuming this energy, transmission and distribution costs are actually starting to outpace the cost of the energy that people are buying because it's so expensive to build and maintain all of that infrastructure. And so what you're looking at is seven to $10 billion of outlay in infrastructure costs to power a million homes. So we could do that very differently. We have the tools, we have the technology, there's a more cost-effective way to do it. So we have a number of new projects that are focused on distributed infrastructure. Energy is just one sector, but instead of having really large facilities that require a tremendous amount of capital, you can have smaller pieces of infrastructure that can be cobbled together into something like a virtual power plant, where you have a bunch of different disparate energy resources, but they all operate on one network protocol, and they have payment streams embedded in them to make that process very easy and very efficient. So this is just one example. Um, and again, if we look at the OSI model, right, which was a huge innovation, a huge step forward in telecommunications infrastructure, we have all of this hardware that's getting built. But we need sort of this network layer that allows all of this hardware to interact and allows money to flow, but also electrons to flow, allows contracts to get exchanged. And so I think blockchains that we've built, this public networks, they're not just for trading, they're not just for speculation. We can actually use them as enabling technology and digital infrastructure to make infrastructure finance much more efficient. And so there are examples today of emerging infrastructure networks that are leveraging public blockchain infrastructure, whether it's in distributed compute, data storage, energy infrastructure, wireless and telco, there's now even mobility data focused startups that are doing this. So that's the structuring side. Let's talk about the financing side. So big challenges here as well. Risk-adjusted returns are low. There's low liquidity, very high transaction costs. If you're going to put $5 billion to work, you're going to do a lot of due diligence. And there's a lot of information asymmetry, particularly in emerging markets where we have the biggest need for this infrastructure. So again, we have the technology. What we've been building in the crypto space, what we call DeFi, are these composable finance building blocks that we can actually use in the real world to build real things that real people use. It's not just for speculation. It's not just for aping into degenerate yields. We can actually use this infrastructure to enable a wide range of financing structures to be built very quickly at very low cost, and especially in places where no formal markets exist, which is the really exciting thing. Because in many parts of the world where we need infrastructure, there's no formal market to facilitate capital to facilitate capital formation. The beautiful thing about crypto is all I need is a phone and an internet connection, and I can access these markets. And so we've done this before. This is what's really exciting to me. When we look at the infrastructure challenges that we face, when we look at just how much capital is needed and how much social and political coordination is needed, we've literally spent the last 10 years doing this in this industry. Bitcoin and Ethereum are two pieces of digital infrastructure networks that are supported by billions of dollars of physical real-world infrastructure, enabling trillions of dollars of annual economic activity. So we know how to build public goods. We now just need to translate all of this crypto infrastructure we've built and actually use it to facilitate and finance public infrastructure goods in the real world. So this is something I'm very excited about. And I want to end this by laying out sort of a crazy vision. I think someone will do this in the next decade. This is going to be a long journey. Um, this is going to take the next 20 years to unfold. But I think it's a huge opportunity. And I think when we hear people talking about it in the crypto space, you hear about real world assets, bringing real world assets on chain. Yes, that's exciting but I think we can go a step further. So here's the vision, and bear with me, and hopefully I'll find some people here who are working on this. Um, but I think this idea of network states and crypto communities with resources coming together and building and owning public infrastructure is really interesting. So I moved to New Hampshire recently, and I've been working with the state government in New Hampshire, which is a small state in the United States on the ocean. And the prompt that the governor's office gave us is how will we make this state a state where there's a lot of crypto innovation? And it started with building physical infrastructure. So nuclear power using small modular reactors to bring a lot of abundant, low-cost energy to the state. 
So you have energy. You can finance that through bonds, or you can finance that through these DeFi primitives and building new financial products. Then you need compute infrastructure, data centers. You can incentivize people to build data centers by making it easy for them to mine things like Bitcoin. But you can also use those data centers for other types of high-performance compute. So we have our data infrastructure. Then connectivity. You attract a lot of telcos, and you have them build better wireless infrastructure. Uh, then on top of that, you add education. You need labor, you need resources, you need talented people who actually can interact with this infrastructure. And so you start to see the emergence of this sovereign sort of network state where infrastructure is actually the underlying scaffolding that makes it possible for these communities to coordinate, to own their infrastructure, to own these resources. And I think this is going to happen. Uh, this idea of network states, there are currently 16 network states around the world that are being built. And I think one of them will at some point do something crazy. I would love to see crypto protocol use its treasury to actually buy real world assets, to buy a telco, to to buy cell towers, to buy power plants, to buy and build massive data centers. And so I'm very excited about the intersection of this industry. And we talk about infrastructure all the time, but we're focused purely on infrastructure in the digital space. I'm excited to build infrastructure in the physical space. And this is going to be a huge opportunity for whoever gets it right. And hopefully we at CoinShares, I'm looking at you, Danny, we'll get to build some of this with some of you in this audience. Thank you for your time. I will be around if anyone wants to talk about infrastructure, finance, and public utility and it's really good to see you all. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much.